This is Ralph Baruch, the author of a television tightrope, How I Escaped Hitler, Survived CBS, and Followed by a Calm Listening to Dave on WGBB. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and uh, even though I'm pretty much a radio guy, obviously I love television just as much, and if you want to know anything about the history of modern television, our guest on the phone tonight is pretty much the go-to guy. His name is Ralph Baruch. And he's written a new book called Television Tightrope, How I Escaped Hitler, Survived CBS, and Fathered Viacom. And you don't, you don't create a book title like that unless you mean every single part of it. And yes, he escaped Europe during World War II, and he had a big, important job at CBS, and he was a founder of Viacom, which eventually became even bigger than CBS. We're going to ask him about all of that right now. Welcome, Ralph. Nice to be with you. No, thanks. And, and um, so, what made you want to finally tell your story in book form after all these years? Well, I thought that uh, people should know about my life. I came here as a refugee and an immigrant and uh, with very little resources and made it uh, very well. Became uh, fairly well known and uh, headed a company, eventually a multi-billion dollar company. And uh, I thought that story should be told for younger people. It just outlines the history not only of my life, but as you mentioned, um, the history of television in many aspects, the history of television regulation, and uh, my encounter with the Hollywood community. And I thought all of these mixed in should be uh, an interesting book to read, and I thought it is, and my editor uh, has has done a marvelous job, Lee Roderick, Mm-hmm. And so we worked together on this for three years, and I thought it would be of interest to a vast audience. Well, I have to say, when I heard about the book and your story, the first thing that grabbed me was, oh my gosh, here's a guy who, who was really, really big and important in commercial network television for all these years, and then founded Viacom, which was really huge in cable. And then I started reading the book, and <laughs> I got so incredibly into your childhood. So I want to start there. Because, you know, I mean, just literally start from the get-go. You were born in Germany. I was born in Germany, and as a very young boy, due to my father's anti-Nazi activities, we had to leave immediately after Hitler came to power. Mm-hmm. We left everything and went back to France, where originally my father came from. And then uh, he again worked for the French uh, pro bono, uh, recruiting spies in Germany. And uh, when Recru- Recruiting spies in Germany meaning... Against the Nazis. He worked for the Deuxième Bureau, counter-espionage. They okay. asked him to volunteer because, of course, he spoke fluent German. And he had a scar on his face. What yes, was that all about? Yes, he had fought before the First World War. He fought, fought 17 saber duels and three pistol duels because of anti-Semitism when he studied in Heidelberg. He studied two years at Oxford and two years in, two years in Heidelberg. Uh-huh. And, and people would just challenge him to duels because he was a Jew? Well, you see... Uh, to study in Heidelberg, you had to belong to a fraternity. Mm-hmm. And there was only one Jewish fraternity. It was called the KC. And he had to wear the little cap and the ribbon, which identified him as a Jew. And, of course, anti-Semitism was prevalent all those years in, in Germany. And mm-hmm. whenever a dispute came along, they insulted him. And the custom was to demand satisfaction. And the only satisfaction the students knew was to fight a duel. Oh, my God. Yes, it's pretty barbaric. I mean, I, I suffered some bullying going to school, but I didn't fight any saber duels. My yes. gosh. So, and, yeah. uh, so he recruited spies, and, of course, the spies at some point disclosed names, and he always went under a false name into Germany. And when the Germans invaded Holland, Belgium, May 10, 1940, he didn't want to leave Paris, but eventually I convinced him. I gave him an ultimatum. I said, it's either you or me. I was a very young man. And finally, after he decided we should go, we couldn't get any transportation. I got a push cart with my grandmother on it, some baggage, and that's how we left Paris. Wow. We were bombed and machine guns on the roads by the Germans, and after three months, got to Marseille. And then through Mrs. Roosevelt, persuading the president, FDR, to issue 500 visa to endangered intellectuals who were stranded in Marseille, we got four of those, and but no French exit visa because the Germans practically ran France, the Vichy government. Right. 
And uh, so we uh, had to go over the border at night, and I carried my grandmother eventually. She was 82 years old. You carried her on your shoulders? On my back. And that's how we got to Spain and eventually to uh, Lisbon and uh, got on a ship called the Nyasa, Mm -hmm. a Portuguese ship, which was built for 260 passengers, and they got about over a 1,000 on it by emptying out the holes and putting cots down. And 1940, we paid 500 U.S. dollars each, which is exorbitant, of course. Which today would be six, seven thousand dollars for an inside cabin for four. My grandmother, my mother, my father, and I, and we landed Hoboken on December 4th, 1940. Huh. And your grandmother survived the trip. She survived the trip and lived another year or so. Okay. And then I got some menial jobs, and finally landed into radio. Well, how did you land in radio? I um, first became a recording engineer, and then I worked for a music licensing organization uh, called CSAC, like ASCAP and BMI, and Mm -hmm. I had to go to radio stations and negotiate contracts. But eventually I walked on Broadway one night, and I passed an appliance store uh, in 1950, Mm -hmm. and uh, I saw about 20, 30 people in front of a television set, very small set, uh, watching wrestling, and I came back two and a half hours later, and they were still watching television, except it was a test pattern. <laughs> and I thought that's interesting, it intrigued me, and I eventually got myself a job as a salesman at the Dumont Channel 5 in New York, mm-hmm. and uh, then joined CBS in 1954 as a salesman. Well, actually, um, one thing I did notice in the book is that 1950 wasn't your first experience of the idea of television. I mean, you had seen it, I think, in a World's Fair, didn't you? I saw it at the World's Fair in Paris in 1937. Did it make an impression? Yes, quite an impression, because uh, this was uh, this was a, something I'd never seen before. It was experimental, of course, but it made an enormous impression on me. And it must have stayed with me because uh, I was intrigued by this and... Then when I joined CBS, I was promoted again, time and again, and I guess I did a good sales job. Mm-hmm. So that was your area. You were just selling airtime. And, and I was selling it. programming, reruns of syndicated programs in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, in New York, and eventually became head of international for CBS, mm-hmm. I guess because I spoke languages, but that was my first encounter with Hollywood. Uh, if I may tell you a couple of stories about Please. that. Yeah. Um, one, my friend, a friend of mine who was a uh, financial area, set himself up as an auditor for movies uh, and for actors and for directors and the like to make sure that the studios treated them fairly in their accounting. And he went to the studio to audit this motion picture. Mm-hmm. And he talked to his equivalent at uh, the studio and he said, I object. My friend said, I object to Catherine Deneuve's expenses, and my fellow on the other side said, why is that? Because these expenses are enormous. She has limousines in New York and for 10, 12 people, and then round trips on the Concord for everybody, and, and again, limousines, and the like. She spends an awful lot of money. And I object to that, and my, the uh, opposing side of the studio said, well, why do you object? Mm-hmm. And the fellow said, because Catherine Deneuve is not in this picture. And this gives you an idea of what the accounting is like. <laughs> I also met uh, David Beagleman, who was uh, Judy Garland's agent. Oh, boy, yeah. And uh, we agreed that we were going to distribute the program overseas, and we shook hands on the deal. And mm-hmm. soon after that, I found out that the show had been sold in Germany, and we hadn't sold it. So I called Beagleman, and I said, David, remember, we had lunch, and we shook hands on the deal, and he said, oh, yes, I remember very well. I said, what happened? You know, we didn't sell it. Oh, he says, Ralph, I lie a lot. I lie a lot. That was his his answer. (laughs) That was my introduction to the Hollywood community. How do you do business like that? I mean, you you did. uh, In in this business, uh, that is unusual. But in Hollywood, it's more of a custom, I guess. But in, in the television business, you make deals and handshake, and the contract isn't signed until weeks, months, or even years later. Were you always able to tell the truth, or did you have to become part of that whole thing? No, I, I kept my integrity. Oh. I try to, uh, the best of my ability, because I knew where I came from, and for me, it was very hard. 
but um, then in 19, uh, in the late 60s, mm-hmm. the Federal Communications Commission uh, had decided that the network should not be in syndication because if you were a producer, there were only three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Uh-huh. And if you were a producer and the show was liked by one of these networks, the network said, well, we like your show, but we want all, the, if we put it on, we want all the rights. Syndication, licensing, merchandising, everything else. And the producer had to give up these rights or he wouldn't get on the air. And so the commission said, the Federal Communications Commission said, Networks should not have an interest in, in syndication and a financial interest in programs and should not be in cable. One of them was called the FinCEN rule. Yeah. So the other networks, ABC and NBC, sold their interest in these programs, and CBS decided to form a new company. And uh, strangely enough, they, the CBS decided that they were going to use this new company, which was still unnamed, mm-hmm. to unload some of the garbage in terms of people that they had. And the first man to be supposed to be head of this new company, his nickname at CBS was Chief Crazy Horse. You're kidding me. Well, no, no. Okay. And, and we, the general counsel to be assigned to this company was an alcoholic. So I guess somebody at CBS decided, let's, let's get rid of some of these people, and that's a good place to put them in. Wow. And then when this, this Chief Crazy Horse resigned, I was asked to take over. Now, what, what did that say about you, though? Well, uh, I guess they had no better choice, (laughs) and they picked me. I sat in Frank Stanton's office. He was head of president of CBS. Uh Everybody called him Dr. Stanton, and he said, I want you to head up this new company, and I asked him a few questions, and I said, well, I'd like to think about it, and I started to get up, and he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I just said, I'd like to think about it, and he pointed to my chair, and he said, take all, all the time you need. And that's how I became head of this new company, which eventually was called Viacom. Wow. And, and Viacom essentially, again, did the syndication stuff. That was what We had all the syndication from CBS, and, of course, we acquired a lot of other products. We also produced programming, uh, and uh, we expanded our cable interest. We bought in cable in, uh, in uh, Cleveland, and we bought cable systems on, on Long Island, in Islip, and in that area. Mm-hmm and uh, expanded our cable interest, and then we bought radio stations and television stations. Of course, we had to do it at a bargain price. We didn't have that much money huh. as a company. Right. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we started in business, very, very small company, 210 people about, and $20 million in sales. Uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC were sued uh, on antitrust charges, and they threw in Viacom for good measure. And, and after we convinced the government that the FCC three times made us wait for the spin-off because we weren't separated enough from CBS, I convinced them that this was an unfair lawsuit as far as we were concerned. We settled it. Mm-hmm. And then I went to CBS because we had an indemnification agreement. And I said, uh, you know, here are my legal fees for this for this lawsuit. And you have to reimburse them. And the chief counsel of CBS, Bob Evans, said, well, I'm going to pay you. I said, what do you mean I'm going to pay you? He said, sue us. This was the attitude that CBS employed. Right. It was somewhat adversarial. <laughs> somewhat. And uh, so Viacom came into being. And uh, before long, we had uh, an array of radio, television stations, and a lot of interest in producing programs. We distributed the Bill Cosby Show, for example. Oh gosh! And many others. And but you, you distributed it. You didn't produce it. You didn't create it. No, we just distributed the worldwide syndication. Wow! The same for Cosby. We distributed uh, the show. We. We helped produce it. We gave the producers an umbrella arrangement whereby we would be the producing umbrella oh. when they sold it to NBC. Hmm. And uh, it was a huge success, of course. Sure. And uh, so um, that was uh, our goal. And then in 90, we started something called Showtime. Oh, my. You and started Showtime? Yes, you? we started circulating cassettes to all the cable systems at the head end. And, uh, of course, we couldn't reach the heights that uh, HBO did. Right. 
But we did fairly well, and then in 1985, we saw an opportunity to buy MTV, Nickelodeon, VH1, the movie channel, and half of Showtime, which we had sold to Warner's. I assume you had a little more money at this point. Oh, yes, <laughs> we had a lot more money then, we, yeah. but we paid five hundred less than $590 million for this. And today, I don't know what, what these channels would be worth, but certainly it's several tens of billions oh, of dollars. my gosh. How so, long were you with Viacom, by the way? When, uh, when did you, or are you still? I beg your pardon? Are, are you still with Viacom, or have you retired? No, no. They've been very nice to me. Some of the Redstone board, as you probably know. Right. And, uh, uh, no, I, uh, I retired some time ago, and I serve on non-for-profit boards. I was on the board of Carnegie Hall for 20-some-odd years, cool. uh, and they made me an honorary trustee. I'm on the board of a hospital, uh, Lenox Hill Hospital in the city. I'm on the board of Channel 13, the PBS outlet. Oh, good. A uh, flagship station in New York, so I, I still keep active, keep busy. We're talking with Ralph Baruch, the author of Television Tightrope, How I Escaped Hitler, Survived CBS, and fathered Viacom, and we've actually <laughs> we've covered sort of all three, but I want to go a little more in depth on a couple of things. First of all, there, there's this current, I mean, I assume you stay fairly current on the issues involving television and radio and, and satellite and all that. Or, or I, try, you, I try to. Any, any thoughts on what's going on now between Viacom and YouTube? No, I'm not familiar with those arrangements, uh, but I believe that uh, any author or any owner of a copyright has the right to be reimbursed for its use. And if somebody uses your copyright, they should uh, they should uh, reimburse you or pay for it. Hmm. And I guess that's the basis for the hmm. lawsuit. So, so you would sort of come down on whose side, though? I would come down on Viacom's side. Hmm. Okay. But, uh, for example, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, which certainly has an enormous influence on this business, has not treated our industry very well. If you look back in its history, they gave us a fairly poor signal by giving uh, 525 lines to television while everywhere else, in, particularly in Europe, it's 625 lines. Right. They allocated the frequencies, you know, the channels. Uh, in 1948, they didn't know what to do, and they waited. They said, we're going to wait a few weeks and, and uh, think about this, how we're going to allocate the channels in various cities so they don't interfere with each other. And they took four years to allocate VHF, channels 1 through 13, uh-huh. and UHF, channels 14 and up, uh, and mix them in, in the same market. Except there's one problem. Between the time they decided to not to do anything and the time they decided to do something to allocate these channels, about 30 million television sets were manufactured, and none of them could receive UHF. Yeah. They adopted a color system, which was the CBS color system, which didn't work too well, and it was non compatible. So if you had a black and white set, you couldn't watch color, and if you had a color set, you couldn't watch black and white. So three years later, they reversed themselves, and they adopted the color system we have today. They had severe restrictions on movies on pay cable, like Showtime and HBO, and the industry, and I headed this committee, eventually had to sue the FCC, and we won in every instance. And they, All right. They went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court refused to, to, to uh, review it. But what the audience doesn't know, or most of them don't know, is that in 2009, that's not too far away, in February 2009, mm-hmm. all of television will switch from analog to digital. Right. So that means that if you don't have cable or you don't have satellite and you receive your television over the air, you have to buy a converter box. Now, there is estimated 75 million television sets that receive the signals in this manner, and they will have to buy a converter box, and they can apply with a form to be filled out, mm-hmm. send it into the government. The government will give you $40 uh, times two, two for your each home, mm-hmm. and they will. This, this is, these coupons are worth forty dollars. Except the boxes will be priced anywhere between sixty and a hundred dollars, and they have to pay the difference. Of course. But as the deadline approaches, the price of these boxes will drop, hopefully. But the coupons are only worth for ninety days. 
they're only valid 90 days, which means after 90 days, they're no longer oh boy. To, to be able to turn it in. So the consumer is, is uh, left in the, uh, holding the bag. Is it going to be the same with radio, too, when radio goes to uh, HD? Or actually, radio, a lot of the stations already are. Yes. No, I, no, I don't think so. But, but the uh, FCC also did. They killed AM stereo. Hmm. You never heard about that again. And how long then, ago? Uh, there were three systems in existence that could receive uh, AM stereo. Well, well, you could receive AM stereo and broadcast it. Harris was one of them. So let's say I have Harris in my radio, and I drive to Philadelphia. They said, the FCC said, let the marketplace decide which system comes out on top. Well, if I'm driving in this car, and I have a Harris system in my car, and Philadelphia, for example, broadcasts a different system, my radio won't work on an AM stereo. So uh, that was gone. We never heard about it again. Huh. Uh, this commission, while they're supposed to look out for the interest of the consumer, doesn't always do that. Oh, surprise. <laughs> well. Do you, um, um, we're, we're going to wrap up this conversation with uh, Ralph Baruch, the author of Television Tightrope. Kind of, kind of wondering of two questions of, if you were to change something that you were involved in all over the years, or if maybe a mistake that you made or, or something that you, you, should have gone for and didn't. What might that have been? Well, uh, trusting people. Huh. Uh, he, I gave a lot of people great opportunities. I hired another general counsel to the place to replace the one that was an alcoholic. And hmm. eventually down the line, I offered him job after job, and he took them. And eventually, despite my, some of my board members' opposition, I made it happen that he became... CEO of the company. Okay. And uh, one day he comes in. We were very close, and we had offices next to each other, and great uh, meetings every day, 15, 20 times. We put our heads, uh, our feet up on the table, and said, "You know, let's talk, talk, talk about, it. let's chat about this." Came in one day, said, "Ralph, we're going to do a leverage buyout, and, uh, using the assets of the company to go private." And I said, well, that's a marvelous idea. We have, uh, you know, we know the company better than anybody. We can cut here and cut there. And he said, wait a minute, you say we all the time. I have uh, formed an inside group. You're not part of it. As a matter of fact, I must tell you that you're dead meat. <laughs> nice. And I was shocked. But he tried to do it so cheaply that a fellow named Sumner Redstone, uh, this, this uh, transaction came to his attention, and this fellow, Redstone, thought uh, that the gentleman who called me in dead meat uh, thought he was stealing the company and outbid him three times and bought the company. But oh. you must uh, remember that in the 1970s, uh, somebody in the cable business went to jail telling Irving Kahn and all the cable stocks dropped. And our stock dropped to two and five eighths. And when Sumner Redstone bought it, he paid the equivalent of $222 a share. Wow. So the shareholders did very well. All right. Well, that worked out exactly the way it ought to have, considering. That's right. And and one last thing. There's just one little story that I would love you to tell our, our readers, because it was such a delightful little moment in the, the early part of the book. And it involves when you were a Boy Scout and your camping experience. Well, um, I, we I must tell you about two experiences. Sure. The first one was... When I was, I was a very young boy, and uh, we went camping in the south of France in Yale, and uh, we took turns making coffee in the morning. And the time I was asked to make coffee and light a fire, I was raining. I couldn't get the fire started. So I took a pound of butter and threw it in the beginnings of this flame, and it threw up. The, 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 the flames went way up, and... The trees caught fire, and they had to call the fire department. <laughs> Gosh. The second experience I had, I was then uh, 13. This is beautiful. I love this story, yeah. And uh, we went camping in England, and we took a walking hike on the Isle of Wight. And we, it was late at night. We were looking for a place to put our tent up, and we finally found a flat place. And it finally went to sleep, and we dug trenches around in case it rained. Uh, so that the water would run off. And early in the morning, the gentleman was 
standing in our tent screaming at the top of his lungs. I couldn't understand English in those days. And he was shaking the uh, center pole of the tent and screaming. And I found out that we had parked ourselves on the green of a golf course <laughs> and had dug so trenches, so that didn't go over too well. I just have this this image of this English guy raving, swinging a golf club. Uh, these little German, ch- well, relatively little German children, uh, who assumed I, I, I'm assuming that they hiked to the middle of the wilderness. And when the sun comes up and you look around and there's like the 19th hole. <laughs> I just love that. That's right. Anyway, I want to thank you, Ralph Baruch, for, for taking some time to talk to us in the neighborhood about your book, Television Tightrope, How I Escaped Hitler, Survived CBS, and Fathered Viacom, available from probitaspress.com. And uh, again, I wish you much success in whatever you're, you're doing. What are you doing now? By well, as I mentioned, I'm on these boards. Yeah. And uh, that keeps me very busy. And hobbies? Uh, some. Uh, I play the piano. Oh. And uh, that keeps me also busy. And you appear on, on our show, which, which is the best thing of all. So, thank you again. It was a pleasure to be with you.